Jim Henson was already over here in England. I live in England as well, which is where you're seeing me here today. Jim was already over here doing The Muppet Show, but he wanted to do his movies here. At the time, it was Great Muppet Caper that we were going to do. But there were a lot of unemployed British people in the film industry at the time. So the Home Office wouldn't give us work permits to come to England because they didn't want us putting any British people out of work. So this British producer said, well, Jim, what you need to do is you need to give your New York crew a title that doesn't exist in the UK. So at that point, we became animatronics designers. And there were no animatronics designers in the UK because there weren't any anywhere because we made it up. <laughs> and um, we all got our work permits and we were able to come over and do the movie. So I did Grey Muppet Caper, and then I went straight on and did The Dark Crystal, and then I went straight on from there and did a load of other stuff as well. So I am the first animatronic designer in the UK and one of the first five in the world because it was just our guys trying to come from the New York shop that invented it in the first place. That is amazing. And great films there, too. The Dark Crystal is one of my all-time favorites. I absolutely love that movie. So that was, I'm assuming that was one of your first. And that um, was around 19, Great 1982? Mupp Great Muppet Caper was the first one that I did over here, yeah. That's awesome, man. I love that. We were in pre-production for Dark Crystal while we were doing Great Muppet Caper. So. What, did you, um, what did you work on? on the dark crystal for some reason I, when I looked you up and, and did my research, it looked like you worked a lot with one of the mystic creatures. I missed the name. The one of the mystics, the older they're like, uh, with the long snout, the gentle kind. Yeah. No, it, in my, <laughs> in my folder in the next room, That's okay. I, um, I built the animatronics. We, uh, Jen and Kira had two different versions of them. There were puppets, but the puppets had radio-controlled eyes. And then there were ones that were fully radio-controlled that rode on the back of land striders and flew down to the sky and did all that sort of thing. I was the treasurer Skeksy. And... Uh, Brian Meal, who is one of the other performers on the movie, his day job was being Barkley the dog on Sesame Street. And in the middle of filming, he had to go back to Sesame Street. So I took over his mystic. So I got to be one of the mystics in the long shots, not in his close ups. He'd already done his close ups. But uh, the favorite one was I got to be one of the Gartham smashing into the Poddling Village. And I was also a couple of the podlings running away from the Gartham smashing into the podling village. <laughs> what a scary scene so that we was. <laughs> did a bit of everything. Yeah. Oh, it was good that fun. Is, absolutely. I'm sure it was. And ironically, Tim, the very first question that I wanted to ask you, <laughs> we are answering. Uh, it was, you mentioned during, on your website, uh, during college, you discovered puppetry. <laughs> And you wanted to learn how to become a millionaire doing puppets. And the question was, how did you manage to get a job at Jim Henson's? And how did you get into what eventually became animatronics? That's actually the first question. So we are, we're all over that. That's, uh, that's amazing. So, uh, what was, right, yeah. yeah. So what was your experience working, uh, with Mr. Henson? And did, did you get to interact, uh, with Jim personally very much? Oh, no, Jim. Jim was fabulous. Um, <laughs> I had, because he was my sort of first boss in the business, I just assumed that the business operated like that. And when I left the Muppets and went to work for other people, I got in a lot of trouble because Jim would 
instead of telling you what to do, he wanted to know what ideas you had. So he was very open and he would interact with all of us a lot. <laughs> and then he would basically listen to all our good ideas and cherry pick the best ones. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time working with him. Right. One of the things that I loved it, for my own education, when I worked in the New York shop on 52nd Street, Jim had a library upstairs, which was the video of everything he'd ever done. So when everybody else left work, I went up to the library and put on a video and I worked my way through all 185 videos <laughs> in the room, showing the entire history of the Muppets. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Muppets just recently became available on Disney Plus, and, you know, a lot of children are seeing the Muppets for the very first time. And mm -hmm. uh, I just think that's something that's, that needed to happen. Very important. We're we're big Muppets fans here. Um, who is your favorite Muppet? I just, I got to ask that. <laughs> 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 I love them all. Now, uh, uh, Gonzo the Great, Dave Golds, is my favorite Muppet. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, speaking of Jim because Henson, and just... go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it's it, it's such he's a wonderful man. It's a wonderful character, and um, the thing when you're into puppets, it's like the puppeteers who really great and what i love is that uh gonzo and rizzo the rat are the mcs all the way through muppets christmas carol now rizzo the rat is a head on top of a tennis ball with a little rod turns left and right and a trigger it makes the mouth open so puppet ways you couldn't get any simpler than that but steve whitmire is so brilliant with it that he keeps him totally alive and you totally entertain clear through that movie and the interplay mm -hmm. between him and Gonzo. So it's Steve and Steve Whitmire and uh, Dave Golds is some of my favorite <laughs> right. puppet time on screen. So, um, well, you had mentioned the dark crystal and, and, your relationship or, or getting to know Jim Henson. What about, uh, mm. if I'm not mistaken, Frank Oz actually directed the dark crystal, I believe. And I know that you, you had to have worked with him with the Muppets. Uh, how, what was your interaction with, uh, Mr. Oz like during, uh, during that time? Um, uh Frank's not as friendly as Jim was. <laughs> he had he had a wicked sense of humor. One of, one of the things that I've um, one of my ambitions I always wanted to do was to make a Yoda for Frank. And even when they had the new one, I didn't. I wasn't able to talk him into letting me do the job because I I knew what he liked. I'd worked with him so much, I knew the sort of puppets that he liked working with. So the story I always tell about Frank is from The Muppet's Christmas Carol. Now, on the TV show, they did four different characters, but in the movies, when the four characters were all on screen together, Frank would choose the character that was the most important in the scene, and then the rest of us got to do his other characters. So in this scene, he was doing Miss Piggy, and it was at Fozzywig's party, and I was doing Fozzywig. But it was just a crowd scene, so, you know, I was with a group of people at the party. And I was very nervous, because Frank's a very particular puppeteer, I've, I've been on set when he's done 120 takes just to get the one take you see in a movie. <laughs> That's how particular he is. Anyway, so I was doing Fozzywig. He was doing Miss Piggy. And we did the first take, and he came over and he said, Tim, 
too much, too much. Just cut it down. You know, you're doing too much. I said, oh, sorry, Frank. I didn't mean to upset you. I was just trying to do what I thought you would do in that situation. Too much. So we did take two, and I did less movement and less animation and everything. Came over, he said, too, too much, still too much. I said, okay, Frank, I'll, I'll do less next time. So I did less next time. And he came over and said it again. <laughs> so by this point, I'd done everything I could think of to do right. And I didn't know what to do. And I was so frustrated, I just said, I'm going to ruin the next shot just because I don't know what to do now. Frank is like, everything I've done, Frank doesn't like, you know. So in the next talk, shot, all the puppets were all moving around. And in the middle of them, Fozzie Bear was there who looked like a mannequin. His mouth was open. <laughs> and he wasn't moving through the entire tape. <laughs> At the end of it, Frank walked over to me and I thought, oh boy, I'm going to catch it now because I've ruined the shot. And he said, Tim, that was perfect. That was just what I wanted from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So that, that's an example of Frank. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, well, he would have liked you... CG now, so he could have done all the puppets and not had anybody ever do one of his puppets. So, <laughs> right, wow, um, and nobody can do a puppet like Frank. So, <laughs> yeah, he uh, de definitely he's a he's a legend in the field, and we're we're fans of him as well for sure. Uh, well, mm. can you can you tell us a little bit more about animatronics uh, it, for those for those people who do not know what is it? And how did it work back then? And, and maybe how did, how has it evolved today? Uh, we started off very simply with animatronics, basically uh, from the original Muppets, if you could get a puppet to blink his eyes, that was a, <laughs> a special thing. So it started with things like eye blinks or um, just making uh, radio controlled versions of the Muppets. We we used um, we made uh, Kermit, Fozzie Bear, and Gonzo to ride in a radio controlled hot air balloon. And the three of them were also radio controlled, just to get a nice shot out in the real world. Jim was always trying to get his puppets out of the studio and into the real world, so. That was a lot of what we were involved with, was trying to make more remotely operated puppets. The puppets became more and more complex as time went on. <laughs> and um, at some point, I, de I described the early animatronics as we were constructing instruments for an artist to play. And at the point where we get to, say, the Dinosaurs TV show or something like that, they were machines that a suit artist had to endure. <laughs> so that was sort of the difference in the evolution of animatronics. I prefer to this day to make instruments that people can play over making the robots, but um, <laughs> that's my own bent my own direction I like to add in. Uh, you could take a, I suppose, a good example for the Star Wars people. The original Akbar, we had to have two versions of them. There was a full body suit that did establishing shots. And then I made a hand puppet that did most of the shots you saw in the movie. And, um, that was actually my own idea. They were just going to have the full body one and just have a bit of movement in the jaw. There was a cable control that came out of my ankle that you could operate the jaw with while I said the dialogue. But I talked to Phil Tippett and I said, we can make something much more filmable, much more live if you let me make a puppet version of Akbar. And so he let me do that very kindly. And uh, then I proved that I was right. Of course, 
you move on to the Force Awakens, and the new Akbar is now entirely full body suit. I'm in a carbon fiber helmet, and I've got 38 servos surrounding my head, so it's like having your head in a birdcage <laughs> mm -hmm. full of budgerigars all chirping and being at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of the difference in the evolution of animatronics. But of course, now it's a... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that there is no more Akbar, you know, so... Yeah, and we did. We want to. Unfortunately, wanna... um, what I did realize from the new movies mm -hmm. was, although the guys in the shop had built the best animatronics we ever had to work with, Jim Henson was dead, and there was nobody left that knew how to film animatronics. <laughs> so, I <laughs> I will leave it there on that. Yeah conversation <laughs> yeah, I understand I understand um, well uh, speaking of uh, that era and that time can you tell us how you ended up I believe the the proper word might be loaned you were loaned to Lucasfilm to be part of Return of the Jedi. And how did that lead to you becoming Admiral Akbar? Well, it's interesting that you say loaned. Because <laughs> I had actually left the Muppets at that point and was unemployed. Okay. But what I discovered on that one and on Howard the Duck, both of which I was working on my own totally independently, I was in fact still being loaned by Muppets because Lucasfilm was paying the Muppets for the use of my knowledge. But they never bothered to tell me they were doing that. <laughs> mm. So I was still working for Muppets and had no idea I was doing it until I walked into a producer's office one day and I saw my salary and I said, well, that's my salary, but what's that salary there? And Well, that's what um, Ensign Associates is being paid. I went, I don't even work for him. <laughs> but anyway. So I had left the Muppets at that point. Uh, the reason being, I wanted to work on Fraggle Rock as a puppeteer. And I went up to Jim. Jim's was right over the road. So you were talking about being close and able to talk with Jim Henson. You could walk across the street and ring the doorbell, you know. So I rang the doorbell and said, I'd like to be a puppeteer on Fraggle Rock. I, I proved that I can do the animatronics, but I can also puppeteer because I did the stuff on Dark Crystal. I did the stuff on Great Muppet Caper. You know, you saw my puppeteering. And he said, your real value to the company was as an animatronics designer. And I realized that I was getting pigeonholed in a position. <laughs> it's the old thing of that if you want to move on, don't be good at your job. <laughs> mm. And I'm, as a young man, I took it as a, I was hurt because I thought he was saying I wasn't a good enough puppeteer. But with time and age, I've realized that what he was saying was that to the company, the animatronic stuff that we were coming up with, that was what was making everybody around the world talk about the movie. <laughs> and he wanted more and more of that stuff to be developed. So he wasn't saying I wasn't a good puppeteer. He was saying, in fact, that I was a very good animatronics designer. Right. But I took it personally, got upset, and quit. And I had an apartment in New York City at the time, left over from the days when I used to work in the New York shop. And I was sitting there, unemployed, saying to myself, all you've ever wanted to do was puppets. You were working for the biggest puppet company in the world, and you quit. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> and my phone rang, 
and there was a friend of mine, Mike McCormick, who had been working with Phil Tippett on the pre-production for Return to Oz. A Return to Oz, sorry. <laughs> Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. They do sound similar, don't they? <laughs> Actually, he was working on Revenge of the Jedi. He was working on Blue Harvest, Horror Beyond Imagination at the time. All right. But he was practicing with a Space Noodles puppet that he'd built, and he built her as a classic marionette. And she weighed about 60 pounds, and he was on a scaffold trying to see how it moved, and he lost his balance, and the puppet pulled him off the scaffold, and he broke his arm. So he couldn't mm. do the show. So that's when he called me up and said, if I could get out to California, I could take over his job in Phil Tippett's shop. So I went out, did my interview, got a job with Phil Tippett, talked him into the puppet for Akbar and all that. But at the time I started in the shop, the only job I knew I had was puppeteering Salacious Crumb. And the Admiral was going to be the character they call Riri's now, the mm -hmm. three-eyed giraffe character. Mm -hmm. And uh, George used to come around in the evening time. You know, I mean, he'd come at 10 o'clock and we were still working there because we had that much work to do <laughs> to get ready for filming. You know, George would come in in the evening time. And that's when he named Salacious Crumb. He looked at the character and gave it a name. And he also started talking about Riri's being the, um, the admiral for the rebel forces. And I said, well, George, the problem with him is he's got three eyes. And Jim had always taught the two most important things to Jim Henson were what he called the magic triangle. And that was the focus of the eyes and the nose. Because just by tilting a head, changing direction, you could express emotion through a puppet character without even saying anything. Because people read those movements from things they've learned from their own past. So I said, this Riri's guy, which eye is going to be looking at you? Because you never, you know, with three eyes there, he's always going to appear untrustworthy and shifty. So that's when we moved over to Admiral Akbar, <laughs> who wasn't called Admiral Akbar at the time. He was just the red guy that had also been made for the movie. And so I started making him and making him whoever was going to operate him. And one day while doing it, I asked Phil, I said, um, so who is puppeteering this character? And he said, oh, we haven't cast him yet. And I said, well, does he appear in any of the scenes that Sice Noodles and Slices Crumb does? And he said, oh, no, he's in an entirely different part of the film. So I said, oh, well, can I do him too? And he said, yeah, sure, if you want to. So that was the sum total of my audition for Admiral Akbar. <laughs> Who became the Admiral. <laughs> and it's amazing that you had a Admiral. role. Yeah, so you had a role in him becoming a much bigger character um, in, in Return yeah. of the Jedi than, than what he would have been. There, yeah. that's, that's so we had, neat. We had a funny one. I was, I was brought in on the force awakens to have my head cast. Cause now I was not working in the workshop I, for reasons I can't discuss <laughs> so many things you can't say anymore. And, um, uh, I was getting my head cast and I went around the guys on the workbenches and I said, so how are you getting on with Akbar, you know? And I was really shocked to find out that they were working from photographs off the internet. I said, Disney didn't send you the original? <laughs> you know, they, he's sitting right there in a box. They didn't send, no, they didn't do any of that. Nothing for reference or anything. And they said, well, we'll be honest with you. We're having a really hard time with his eyes because on the two-dimensional photographs, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what's going on and i said oh well you know what you need to do you need to talk to the guy that made him in the first place and they went do you know who that was 
do you know how to get, do you have an email for him? Do you have any of that? And I says, yeah, I got all that stuff. Cause it was me dummies. <laughs> <laughs> I turned his eyes up on a lathe, you know? So, so I explained about how I'd back turn the eyes and made the pupils go out into it using the lens effect and all that carry on, you know? And that's how Akbar got, even though he's wall-eyed, mm -hmm. he does have eye focus when he looks at the camera. As you can see, see, I'm looking at you. No, no, put them. Stop that. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> That's great. So, so I, I drew out drawings for them of how I made Akbar's eyes. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of um, salacious crumb that you that you mentioned, I believe there's a story that uh, maybe Harrison Ford got upset or something about when you were voicing the character? Well, that is a, a long and involved story. And if you would like to go to admiralakbar.co.uk, I've written it all out and put it there. <laughs> okay. But I, I, I've told that one enough now. I've told it too I much because um, Her Harrison wouldn't talk to me a set of force awakens i think because he he heard the story as well so you know. mm, i see <laughs> what I am see. i going to do about it <laughs> that's a, well we will go check that out for sure uh do you have any other good stories or interactions uh with cast members uh back for for jedi one of my favorite ones was with carrie because um we were shooting the whole bit with her chained up to jab of the hut and salacious was sitting there next to her and everything. And of course you spend a lot of time doing nothing and trying to entertain yourselves. There was uh, Mike Edmonds, who was one of the Ewoks, who was also in the tale of Jabba. One of his favorite things was the in between takes, he would uh, look on his monitor and see where I was with Salacious and I'd hear him go, batter up, and jab his tail would swing back and then swing forward, and he'd try to knock the puppet off my arm because <laughs> it it amused him. <laughs> so that was one way we used to spend time. But my favorite one was with Carrie that um, I was a big fan as a child of the Adams family, and Gomez Adams had this thing with Morticia where he'd take her by the hand and start kissing his way up her arm. And then the front door would ring and he'd go get out a piece of chalk and put a mark there and go, oh, cat me, I shall return, you know, and all this sort of. Salacious used to do that with Carrie. I'd start down at her ankle and start kissing my way up her leg. And then they'd call turn over and I'd go, oh, I shall return, cat me, you know, <laughs> which managed to make her laugh. Now, of course, if I'd done that, I would have been fired off the production, but a puppet can get away with things like that. So <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Another um, salacious one was um, I, I was buried inside of Jabba's throne, which was a big platform that rolled forward and backward. And the crew would roll it backwards and then put a ladder up from the pit underneath the floor so I could climb into the underside of it and then we'd roll back forward to where the rank or pit was and do the scene that way. So I was in the character looking at the rank or pit when they called lunch and all the crew ran out of the studio. But I was actually still inside Jabba's throne <laughs> and couldn't get myself out until somebody rolled it back. So I got to spend all lunch in the dark <laughs> with my puppet on. That's when you do a good job with a puppet because everybody starts thinking it's alive and talking to it and forget that there's a mug that has to get back out of the set afterwards. So. Oh, it's salacious. He can run in and have his own lunch, can't he? <laughs> yeah. um, I, I would have to ask you, uh, with all of those interactions, someone who has, was on The Muppets, who is a, a world-renowned voice actor, I'm going to have to guess you had some pretty good interactions with Mr. Hamill. I'm a royal down voice actor. I, I think I'm, I'm the man <laughs> who spent his entire life being over voiced by other people. I, 
<laughs> oh yeah. We're doing a but BBC what... production recently, and I built the character, and I was performing the character, and I was doing the voice for the character, and I was really excited about it. And suddenly I got called in the producer's office, and they said, Tim, you've done such a fantastic job with this character. We want to take it the whole way, and we're going to get a named voice actor to come in and overvoice your performance. And oh thought, man! The one time in my life, I thought somebody was going to actually hear my voice, but no, You're right? <laughs> it wasn't to be. Yeah, that uh, that Nick wanted to ask you a question that's kind of similar to that. Um, he wanted to know if you knew Tom Kane personally, who did the voice for Akbar in the animated series. Um. I, I don't, that's oh, just sure. a question. Yeah. That he, that he wanted to ask. Look at that. That's <laughs> me, Tom Kane and our agent for convention, Zach. <laughs> Having fun of entertainers in a hotel photo booth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Now absolutely. I tell you, we were. I, so there I am. I'm there with um, having a meal in a restaurant, and we were across the road from Disneyland. And Disneyland was having their Star Wars evening fireworks extravaganza. And uh, I was there, Brian Herring was there, BB-8, um, Tom Kane was there, done my voice, uh, a few other people. Anyway, so a load of us who had all helped them make these movies were all sitting in the table there, and we were all sort of bemoaning the fact that none of us had tickets to this event. And Tom Kane and this... As, as we were talking, this voice came booming from over the road. There was the MC for the entire evening's event. And he said, well, you guys feel bad because you don't have tickets. That's my voice over there, and I don't have a ticket either. <laughs> so Tom had done the voiceover for the entire evening, but none of us had gotten invited to the event. So, Oh, man. Can I say more about the new regime. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It sure does. I'll drink to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, my friend. Um, well, what about... I've tried not. Uh, my, my wife said you're not allowed to go bitter and twisted, so I've had a, <laughs> I've had a calm down sip of water, and I'm not going to go bitter and twisted. So. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, what about any interactions with Mr. Hamill on the set of Return of the Jedi? We, I've got to ask you, you know, we're, we're huge Luke Skywalker fans. So, and he, he was on the Muppets. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you had some pretty good interaction with him as well. Oh, that, <laughs> the, the Star Wars Muppet show when Mark was all of 18 years old, I guess or something. Um. That is absolutely wonderful. It's, it's a classic show, if ever there was one. But uh, now I didn't talk a lot with Mark. I do. I found out the over here they they've just had um, Dave Prowse's charity charity auction, mm -hmm. and they off a load of. Uh, well, they were selling off a load of things for this auction, you know, that he had collected over the years. And I found out that when we do photos or sign photos for each other, we usually put something personal on them and obviously don't charge each other anything or anything like that. But they sold off the picture that I did for Dave of Admiral Akbar, and it got 500 pounds. <laughs> and I was like, What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't get that much myself. What I said. <laughs> Tell about it. You know. 
So, Mark Hamill, we were doing the celebration in Japan, and of course he was incredibly busy, and so, you know, you, you give your time to the fans, there's not a lot of time left. But his daughter, Chelsea, was bored, and she really liked my wife, and so she came over and she hung out with us for a lot of the day, you know, just chatting and carrying on things. So at one point I turned to her and I said, uh, Chelsea, I've never actually gotten a signed Mark Hamill picture. Do you think you could swing one for me? <laughs> you know? And so she goes running off to see her dad. And she comes back and she's giggling away. And I say, what's so funny? And she holds this picture up. And Mark had written on it, Tim, you've had your hand up the ass of some of my favorite characters. Because <laughs> it's a... It's the standard puppet joke, you know, that we like sure. putting our hands up the backsides of puppets. Right. So, so that was hilarious. my one to Mark Hamill. Do you think I could get 500 for that one? Or? <laughs> uh, I would think so. <laughs> I would think so. Uh, I, I, well, it's we, not we, for sale. I'm keeping it with me forever. So. <laughs> absolutely. I would not sell that treasure. Um, well, uh, Tim, we've got a... I want to ask you. You know, there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, I guess, fan backlash. Uh, there's been a lot of fan backlash to Disney and the sequel trilogy. And there was a lot of people who were very upset us included, of how Admiral Akbar had his exit in the film. Uh, what could you share, or what would you like to share well, with the fans? Fans of you, fans of the character, and, and you know, many of us were heartbroken to see uh, what had happened to that character. Uh, so what would you like to say about that experience? I'm with you. I was heartbroken as well. <laughs> Uh, with the new regime, every movie I ever worked on until the recent ones, everybody's given grip and everybody reads it. But I suppose with the advent of the internet and all that, that can't happen anymore because everybody's in such a rush to find everything out that they end up spoiling the whole thing, you know. So we were only given the script on the day we had to sign out a copy of the script, uh, the page of the script on the day that we were filming it. So after The Force Awakens, where so much of what I'd done never ended up being seen in the final edit, I was really rather hoping that Admiral Akbar would get something a bit more old school and a little bit more juicy than what he'd done. And um, so the day came and I got my script and looked and went, oh, I'm going out the window. <laughs> so I found out that Akbar was no more. On the day we filmed, Akbar was no more. <laughs> mm. So to say that I was a little bit upset was uh, an understatement. But they did actually film... Uh, we, we did all our dialogue bits, and then they brought in three stunt guys and replaced us, and we blew the whole set to pieces with real pyrotechnics, not CG, to the point where only the camera crew and three stuntmen were allowed to be in there. Everybody else had to get off set and watch it from the monitors. And it was quite spectacular. I mean, Akbar and his two assistants got blown clear across over to where Carrie had been standing. And then they were on snatch lines and they got pulled out through the broken glass and clear up to the ceiling of the set, which was 60 feet, 70 foot pole. So <laughs> it was spectacular. But it was also, um, I suspect, <laughs> it was decided that it was too horrific 
because you never seen the movie it, effectively you know they they did shoot an end to akbar <laughs> but it, i don't think they uh wanted to show it after they saw what they'd done so i i want to tell you that uh you know, the fans love you and the fans love Akbar, and he lives on uh, in the extended universe where Akbar is in games and other media, and he wound up retiring happily and after many years of service in the New Republic. So I uh, just take refuge in that thought, please. So we, we really appreciate <laughs> you and that character. So, and that's, that's coming from a whole lot of fans. Um, on to happier moments, Tim. Um, let's talk a little bit about happier Howard moments, the Duck. Yes. Yeah, let's talk about Howard the Duck a little bit. Um, <laughs> in your oh, own words... Now. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> uh oh. Uh, well, in your own words, for our audience uh, who may not know, who is Howard the Duck, and how did you get that role? Uh, who is Howard the Duck? He, he was just a, uh, a comic book character. I'll tell you a funny side story. <laughs> I was at a convention, and Stan Winston was there. And one of my fans came up to me and said, so have you talked to Stan yet? And I said, well, no, I, you know, I don't really know him or anything. He said, yeah, but you were Howard the Duck, man. You were his first Marvel comic ever to be made into a movie. You know, you got to talk to Stan Winston. <laughs> anyway, I stayed at my table doing my thing and he stayed at his table doing his. And when I got back to the hotel, as you know, you've probably gone to these conventions and things. <laughs> The elevator door was closing. Well, if that door closes and you're not on it, it could be 40 minutes before it comes back down because it gets so busy, <laughs> don't they? Mm -hmm. So anyway, the door was closing, and I dove head first through the door just to make it on before the door is closed and found myself standing alone with Stan Winston in the elevator. <laughs> but the only <laughs> thing I could think of to say to him was, I was Howard the Duck. I was the first movie, you know, the, <laughs> Marvel movie. Well, somewhere up here, uh, Stanston's, uh, oh, it's a marvelous life. And so I was reading about Stan Winston now that he's no longer with us and found out why he didn't talk to me in the elevator because he'd left New York and gone out to L.A. and he was desperately trying to get his Marvel characters into the movies. And, of course, the first one to be made into a movie was Howard the Duck. And at the time, it bombed so horrendously badly that nobody offered Stan another chance for one of his characters to be in a movie for 10 mm. years. <laughs> so to say he didn't like Howard the Duck much <laughs> was a great wow. understatement, I guess, because we didn't have a lot to talk about in the whole ride in that elevator. I can put it that way. <laughs> wow. Well, well, good on you for busting in there and telling it. And I only found and, out why reading the book after. <clears throat> so. Right. Howard the Duck is the movie that as an animatronics designer, I am the most proud of. I was not happy with the look. I was in direct disagreements with the director because I said, your core audience for this film are the comic book collectors people who've been reading Howard for years already, mm. and your duck doesn't look like the character in the comics. His feeling was that we had to make him, oh, what do you call it? not humanoid, but he had to cross between the cartoon and real life because cartoons wouldn't work in a movie with real people in it. Of course, nobody done Roger Rabbit yet, so, you know, we couldn't say anything. Anyway... <laughs> how how I got onto the movie <laughs> was um, it was being done. The duck was being built by Elaine Baker, who was Rick Baker's wife, 
uh, Gorillas in the Mist, the uh, what was that? The American Werewolf in London, all those things. Rick Baker had done. I I had actually been working with Rick Baker on Greystoke, and I had tried to talk Rick with his gorillas into making the close-up gorilla into a puppet. And over the course of my time working with Rick. Oh, now this goes all the way back to the beginning <laughs> where I had been taught how to work in the movie business by Jim Henson. So these California guys, Rick and his crew, I was just doing what I would have done at Muppets. I said, oh, I see you're having a problem with that. I've done this before. I know how to solve the problem. Just do it this way. And of course, being Californian, they were all immediately, this guy's trying to take over our job. I wasn't trying to take over our job. I thought we were all working on the job together. Hmm. Anyway, not only didn't they let me make the puppet of the gorilla, they fired me off the movie. And what finally got me fired off, it had a lot to do with Elaine because we drove home every night when Rick would work late. And I said something in the car that she told Rick and he came out the next day and fired me on the spot because of the Chinese whispers. <laughs> I didn't say anything I thought that was worth getting fired for, but he seemed to think it was. So now Elaine's working on Howard the Duck and making the duck. And they'd been working on it for seven months. And with about a month to go or a little more, they didn't have a duck to film on. So George went to Phil Tippett and he said, what are we going to do about this? You know, we're meant to be filming in a month and we don't have a duck that works. And Phil said, well, you need somebody like that guy that did Akbar. He sorted him out. He said, well, who is that? It was Tim Rose. Well, we're, where is he? He's in England. Well, get him over here. <laughs> <laughs> so I once again got a telephone call <laughs> asking if I could come over. And it, it was myself. And a Polish guy, uh, Tad Shinovsky, who was the best animatronics designer I've ever worked with in my life. I mean, he went on. He, he came over with me and stayed in Hollywood. It's this stuff he's done since then. It's just incredible. But um, I asked him, I said, Tad, why are you so good at this stuff? And he said, well, you must understand in Poland, if the family needs a car, you go to the field and you dig up all the stuff left over, blown up from the Second World War, and you weld it back together and you make a car. And that's how you get a car for the family to drive in. So he had always been making stuff from the time he was old enough to walk, you know, which is why he was so good. And um, we only had a month to turn everything around and build the final version of the duck that you saw in the movie. And of course there was a hand puppet version for doing scenes. I'd completely forgotten about the uh, puppet until uh, I got a DVD of Howard the Duck because people kept talking to me about it at conventions and I realized I hadn't seen the movie in 20 years so maybe I better watch it. <laughs> <laughs> And um, the two things that I loved about watching it again was, A, um, to get me to come work on Howard the Duck and to say sorry for something that had been done to me during the filming of Return of the Jedi. Uh, George had bought me a Harley Davidson. So wow. <laughs> I was so in love with my Harley Davidson that I sit into the back of the shot when Howard first comes down to earth and goes in the garbage can and comes out and walks up the alley. I got my Harley in the back of it as I saw the camera guys lay in the tracks and I, I pulled it in there and parked it so that it would be there forevermore. I don't have it anymore, but at least it's, <laughs> I can see it on the movie if I want to. And um, the other thing was the Howard the Puppet they, they'd arrested him and they were saying, oh, we got to get this uh, 
get the duck suit off of this guy so we can arrest him. And they say, I think his duckiness is sort of for real, sir. And they got this shot with him totally stripped down in front of the filing mm -hmm. cabinet. <laughs> well, I'm in the filing cabinet with my arm at full stretch trying to hold up a puppet I wished I'd made a lot lighter because <laughs> the pain was excruciating. But in the words of Frank Oz, if you're not suffering, you're probably not doing it right. So, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that was my two things I liked about watching. Sure. Well, since you had to go rewatch the movie for your fans, uh, let me ask you this. What is your favorite scene from that movie? <laughs> Hmm. Well, I mean, it would have to be in bed with Leah Thompson. But <laughs> 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 that that did always crack me up. To see. The funniest bit, I tell you, the um, length of time, talk about animatronics, the, the length of time it took us to be able to build a set of hackles that could rise on cue. <laughs> Because when Howard gets amorous, his, his feathers, his crest come up, don't they? You know, they start sticking up. It uh -huh. was a funny little, it was a funny little gag, you know, the, the director just mentioned in passing. And four days later, <laughs> when we finally got to make that little gag actually happen, you know, we had no CG. Everything had to happen in camera. Absolutely. I like the... Uh, him and him and uh, uh, Tim when they were flying in the airplane and being chased by the police and everything that was all very exciting to to film and do it was enjoyable. Remember Absolutely. the day Jeffrey we we were filming in the uh, uh, cafe and they were trying to work out how they were going to do the alien voice when he starts transforming you know and uh, into the alien and when he was shooting the scene he just came out with this voice and it's like we don't have to do a thing that's it right there. <laughs> you know, all of us just went Ooh, the second we heard it you know it's like that's perfect couldn't do any better without it and post if he wanted to so uh, he got the he got to do his own voice so Okay. <laughs> Would you like a, a real Howard the Duck story? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I was the master puppeteer for Howard. It took five of us to do it. Ed Gale was in the suit. The other guys were running various animatronic bits and everything. But I was doing the guide track for the puppet. And I'd been told from the very beginning that I was doing the guide track because Robin Williams was going to be the voice of the duck. So one day when we were filming the scene we've already talked about when he was in with uh, Leah and her loft, uh, Robin Williams came around the corner. And I looked at him and I said, well, Robin, sit down and have a go with the controls because if you can puppeteer as well, I can get back to England and marry my pregnant fiance because she'd come and visit me at Christmas time. And um, ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had a bun in the oven, as they say. <clears throat> so he sat down at the controls and the sound guy said, Oh, Robin Williams is there. So he cranked up the volume on the microphone because Robin Williams always says something funny. But he must have been watching me because then he started doing the voice for the duck that sounded like the voice I'd been doing for the duck. And you're going to have to put your bleep bleeps on this next bit, but you can edit it. So sure. the director screamed out and said, Rose, you how many times have I told you not to talk on that microphone when I'm out here directing? And the first AD ran up to him and said, that's not Tim Rose, that's Robin Williams. And quick as that, he goes, Robin, love what you're doing. 
<laughs> so, uh, wow. Gavin turned to me and he says, um, "Is that how things are?" Uh oh. You know, is that the way it is around here? And I looked at him and, quite honestly, I said, "To be honest with you, he's in a pretty good mood today. He's been a lot worse than that." <laughs> <laughs> and he said, thank you very much. And he walked away and he kept on walking and he, he ever did the voice for Howard on the movie. Mm-hmm. Of course, then I got in trouble because I'd only been doing the soundtrack. I'd only been doing the guide track that the voiceover artists would have in their ears while they were doing the final track. So I'd been trying out different voices. If I was to do Howard, what voice would I use? <laughs> so I've been doing different voices. And then I got called in. They did a rough edit of the movie, and I got called in, and the director was livid with me. What the hell have you been up to? And I said, what do you mean? He said, your voice for Howard, it's all over the place. And I said, well, I get to come watch daily, so I was trying out different voices to see what one I liked for him. You know? And um, I had settled on one, and they decided that since they didn't have Robin there, they were actually going to use my voice. But I got taken into a dubbing theater, having never done voiceover work in my life, after working seven days a week, 16 hours a day for nine months. And they put the cans on my head, and I had to listen to the voice they didn't want in my ears while doing the voice they did want for the bit of the film. And he gave me all of eight and a half minutes to try and get it right, and then just said, oh, you're impossible, and didn't let me do it, and they went and got somebody else to overvoice the character. Now, the full end of the story, I always thought that it was that day that had been the reason Robin Williams hadn't done the movie. Fast forward 15 years, I'm working on a kid's TV show over in England doing a little character called Balgit. And I get sent up to London to interview Robin Williams, who's doing his tour to advertise Mrs. Doubtfire. So when I get in there, they go, you have 15 minutes with Mr. Williams. If you don't get your film done in that 15 minutes, that's it. Your video comes out and that's what you get to do. There's nothing else. We can't waste time here today. So it's like the pressure's on. I can't waste any time. (laughs) So I walk in the door, hold down my hand. I say, Mr. Williams, I know you don't remember me, but, and I only got that far before he looked me straight in the eye and went, Rose, you f***. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Now, I tell this story for two reasons. <clears throat> the one is, can you imagine the sort of human being that has a brain that never forgets anything? That was five minutes or less of this man's life, and 15 years later, all he did was look my eyes and hear my voice, and he knew who he was talking to. Now, that's terrifying of its own. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I always said, I've always wondered, did that have anything to do with you not doing the movie? And he went, oh, you better believe it. Life's too short to (laughs) waste time working for people like that. Unfortunately, I did it for nine months, but, you know. (laughs) So anyway, I'd been given this script, and I only had the 10 minutes I had left because I'd already talked for five minutes to shoot the bit we needed to shoot. And they turned over camera And my puppet looked at him and said, Oh, Captain, my Captain, I've only got one question. Could you say, Good morning, Vietnam, just once? (laughs) And he looked over and he said, Sound guys ready? And they were like, Everybody was ready because we all wanted to hear him say it. (laughs) And he went, Good morning, Vietnam, because he'd been talking Doubtfire for the last eight hours. You know, he was, he was like so ready to dump. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, to get rid of a bit of angst on his own, you know. And I thought, well, here I go. I'm going to take this back and get fired yet again. But uh, they actually really liked what I'd managed to get on film. So <laughs> that's great. What a great story! I didn't get fired that, that day. <laughs> so. uh, well, thank you for sharing that. Um...
what are what are some of your other favorite characters that you've done throughout your career that's been, you know, rewarding to you? Well, Elf Ralph, Jim, Tim on the Labyrinth. Because I, I designed these floating eye cradles. One of the animatronic problems was with universal eyes, you've got eyelids that blink and you have eyes that move around. But unfortunately, as soon as the eyes look up, they would disappear into the eyelids. So I made um, floating eye cradles so that it would move the foam as the eyes looked up and down and they would go with them. And Jim was so excited by this, he like ran the camera in about a foot away and went, oh, don't get that close because I didn't spend that much time gluing the eyelids on. You know, but he just loved how alive these eyes were. Well, of course, now we do it all with computer. We just put a servo on every single individual movement and the computer coordinates the opening and closing and the moving around and everything. But this was at, at its time. <laughs> it was a, a breakthrough, I suppose. Um, the character itself was nothing to talk about. It was a it was a red frog in a movie called Sword of the Valiant. But I got to act with Sean Connery. Now he had been a hero of mine from childhood, so the getting to act with him was great. And the the scene was actually it was his death scene. And they had needed an animatronic head so that he, um, while he's saying his final lines, his head sort of shrivels away into his helmet because he was dressed as a medieval knight. And it shrivels away into his helmet and he turns to dust. And there was no CG, so we had to work out a way to do that. But not only that, there was no animatronic head because I was there to make the frog and I'd done my bit, and the guy that was supposed to make the head had already left the set and gone back over to England because we were filming in France. And they had no head. So the director said, Tim, you've got to do something about this. So I'd found, the guy had left, I'd found in his workshop a foam skin of Sean Connery, and I put a party balloon in it with a, a long hose coming out of it, and I put finger stalls onto the mouth, and I had the makeup lady help me do the makeup on the face and make it look like Sean Connery and everything. And I stayed up all night, got no sleep, and came running on the set, and they dug a pit for me, they stuck me in the floor, they stuck my head inside the helmet, and the director said, turn over. And I heard, excuse me. And Mr. Connery said, um, this young man and I, are we meant to act together? And the director said, yeah, yeah, but you're going to say the dialogue. He's going to do the mouth sync for it. And the head sort of shrivels up and goes away. And that's the way we're going to do it. Okay, turn over. Excuse me. <laughs> if we're meant to act together, don't you think we should rehearse? And I looked over at him from underneath the <laughs> armor and said, thank you, thank you, because... I didn't have a clue what the dialogue was. I'd spent the whole time just making this thing, you know, let alone rehearsing or seeing if it worked, you know. So they called tea break. And I got to, first off, apologize for the extreme crudeness of the animatronic, but <laughs> it was what I could do in a 12-hour period, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a couple of, quick run-throughs and he said um so if i said the dialogue slowly that would help you and i said oh yes that would help me a lot <laughs> and so we got it to the point where uh we looked pretty good and when we turned over i slowly let the air out of the head and the head sort of shriveled in on itself and for something that only took 12 hours and cost a party balloon it actually looked really good on film <laughs> So that's sort of, I, I really like that one because uh, I got to work with Sean Connery and I like the fact that things can look good on film and don't necessarily all have to cost a hundred thousand pounds. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. You know, so that's, that's a great story. Howard the duck. Yeah. Uh, Tim and Howard are flying in their little microlight and they're being chased by the 
police cars and the cars are turning over. So this is a spectacular thing, all done pre-CG. So once those cars turn over, you better have the shot because you just wrecked five police cars. I'm always amazed on film sets that ADs, the, the young people who are called assistant directors and they're really just glorified gophers, you know, are running around. Because they have walkie-talkies on their waist, everybody listens to them and, you know, does what they tell them to do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, they'd sent the ADs up to both ends of this road. It was a, a road that was um, out in Northern California and it went out towards Bolinas at the other end. And we'd set it all up to do our filming on. And they sent the ADs up to the ends of the road to close it until we'd finished the shop. So this AD up at the end, he said, right, close the road on my end. And he walked over this truck and he told the guy, I'm sorry, but uh, we've had to close the road for 45 minutes. That's all you have to wait. And then we'll let you through. And this guy looks at him. He reaches up. And he pulls his shotgun and puts it out the window. And he says, boy. I've been working all night and my bed's at the other end of that road. Now, you're going to let me through, ain't you, boy? <laughs> and we heard over the radio, one more truck coming through. One more truck before the road's closed down. <laughs> 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 Finally, somebody who didn't believe, <laughs> you know, this carry-on and nonsense. We got it over here in England, too. I was uh, doing a kid's program, Barnaby Bear. BBC show mm -hmm. and it took us like 30 minutes to set this scene up on the beach but it was a public beach where all the people were there but we wanted all the people there because it makes the shot look more exciting and more real you know and just when we start to turn over this family ma pa grandpa and the five children all come and they line themselves up right across the back of our shot and all stare directly at camera. And we said, well, we don't mind if you're in shot, but you know, look like you're doing something or having fun or going to the water, all that walk through the shot. No, we don't want you filming on our beach. You can just move out of here. <laughs> it's like, uh, it took us half an hour just to set all this up. And now we're going to move out of here. <laughs> so we reset the whole shot another way. And they came over and stood in the back of the shot because they didn't want us filming on their beach. <laughs>
And I was in a hotel, so I had no way of even printing off the non-disclosure agreement to sign the non-disclosure agreement <laughs> to get back to him and talk to him. So I just sort of said, okay, Brian, pretend I've signed the non-disclosure agreement, which I will sign when I get back home and print it on my computer. What do you want? Well, we want you to be Akbar again. Oh, okay. <laughs> of course I will, I said. And when I got home, the first thing I did was run up the workshop and pump up the tires of my bicycle because I knew I had to start <laughs> doing some <laughs> serious getting back into shape. <laughs> Mm -hmm. If I stood any chance of surviving the um, process of being Akbar, because mm -hmm. it's That's... it's not an easy easy thing to do. Right. Now that brings up the next story. We'll go straight on to. We'll come back to this guy. The he is Akbar from the Force Awakens. Mm -hmm. While doing a convention in Germany. I got to meet the guy who made the original Akbar for Hasbro. So how cool was that? You know, I could get to talk to this guy and find out well, how it was done in those days and everything. You know. Well, of course, these days, it's not done like that anymore. We finished the day's filming and they said, Tim, you got to stay in costume. And they throw me on a um, golf cart and they take me up the back of the studio to another film set that is 60 cameras all in a circle and you stand in the middle of it with your arms out and they shoot you from all 60 cameras. And then of course that gets sent off to the toy people who just do a 3D model based from the scan and then they have their toy. So there's no guy sculpting it anymore. You know, sometimes I guess they do touch-ups because not everything reduces the way it should. And uh, one of the funny things that had happened to me on this production was I'd done all my fittings. We'd even done a little bit of filming and I got called back to wardrobe. And the two ladies that had been doing most of the work on my costume, when they saw me come into the road, they put their eyes down and they like ran off someplace. They were very busy, had to be someplace else. And I thought, that's very strange. They're usually a lot friendlier than that. And then one of the guys came over to me, he said, um, Tim, we don't know quite how to broach the subject, but we we're wondering if you would consider one of these. And he was holding up two different versions for me to choose from of a male girdle because they had decided that my middle-aged pot belly was ruining the, ruining the lines of their Akbar costume. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, thank you very much. I guess I didn't work out <laughs> quite as much as I tried to, you know, to get this shot. Anyway, then they released the toy. And what really cracks me up is that I obviously forgot to wear my girdle that day because <laughs> immortalized <laughs> in the plastic is my middle-aged pot belly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I remember the Akbar figure from Kenner from 1983, mm -hmm. and you were slim and trim, my friend. Like, that's, a, that's one of the best figures in the line. Uh, so I've, but hey. I found a picture. I found a picture of me back then. I w I was in very good. I I liked working out those days, and I was in good shape. <laughs> it happens. If only I could be. That's it. <laughs> yeah, back then the uh, the waist was uh, twenty four and the chest was forty four. Now it's wow. the other way around. You know. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> How many times did you ever see Kathy Kennedy on set? Uh, we've already heard a bit about the day that I died. Mm -hmm. The day that I died, she was sitting directly in front of we had our little dressing station on the side of the set because the set's all elevated you know for the spaceship and, then, 
And we had our dressing station on the side of set. And Kathy was set up with her big monitor directly in front of our dressing station. And I had read the bit of script and I desperately wanted to go over to the director and go, well, couldn't Akbar have any thing, any final moment? You know, it's like we get blown out. And Carrie's going to get blown out too. Couldn't I have one arm around the console and at least try to save her or something as we're being sucked out the window or, you know, something that made it look like I wanted to help, you know, I was doing something good. And Kathy Kennedy was watching the animatic, I don't know what you call it. She was watching the movie of the bit that we were going to be filming because everything had already been done and decided and drawn before we ever filmed it at which point i saw what happened to me but also what happened to carrie and how she came back and i didn't <laughs> so it's, well there's no point in going ask him to save carrie because she saves herself oh well <laughs> so <laughs> that, that that was that so Obviously, he was there at the studio with us, and I wasn't allowed to go say hi because nobody was meant to know that he was there so that nobody would know that Yoda was in the movie. One of the things that cracks me up about all that, they went to all that effort, they made an original Yoda and everything, but then when they did it with the movie, the CGI guys put a blue glow over the top of them and made the puppet look like a CG character. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they had Frank doing it, they had Puppet Yoda, and then they made it look like a CG character. <laughs> of course, for for us animatronics guys, that's the the our new thing. The, our biggest compliment now is when we tell people we did something, they go, Really? We thought that was CG. We said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> that's a compliment, isn't it? <laughs> that, that, that's the new compliment now, that they thought it was CG. Yeah. When in fact, animatronics is so much better than CG. But Yeah. Well, and it's a shame drum, that you couldn't even go it, speak to him, you know, having known him for so, so many years. Yeah. Yeah. But um, what I do have... <laughs> I've got <laughs> my, I, I bought a um, Yoda hat. And of course, then after the return of Jedi, we were doing the um, labyrinth and Frank was directing on it. And I went over, and I said, Frank, could you sign my Yoda hat for me? <laughs> so I, I, Frank signed my, my Yoda hat. <laughs> Did he did he say anything about you having your arm up a puppet's butt or anything or? No, no, no. They, they, don't, <laughs> they don't do that. They don't find that stuff funny at all. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. But what you said about the Yoda, because so many people, myself included, when we first saw that Yoda in the Last Jedi, it did not look right, and it, and it never will. Like that, it's just off. It it doesn't look like the way that it should. So it's so, but I can never put my finger on why. And then you you saying that about the blue and making it look CGI, uh, it definitely made it look not real. labyrinth story do it all those goblins had radio controlled eyes they were hand puppets with radio controlled eyes so it took one performer to do the puppet and another one just to make the eyes look around and blink so i built they most of the arms were rotted arms so i built a direct servo control system 
where with your index finger while operating the arms, you could point your finger and make the puppet look where you wanted it to. And then with your thumb, you could either blink or make the eyes go surprised and all that. And I was really proud of this thing. And I took it in to Jim and Frank and I showed it to both of them. And both of them, these master puppeteers, said that was far too much to ask one performer to do. And it never got used. I still have it up in my workshop because I refuse to throw it away. But Tony, one of the British guys, had seen this. And after the movie, when I was laid off, because, of course, the American always got laid off. He only got brought on. <laughs> For 40 years in England, I've always been the last person to be hired on every production. And Tony was given the chance to do R&D. And he took that and... Eventually, they created what they called the tower system to run through the computers, which if you see in behind the scenes from dinosaurs or any of that, what used to take six puppeteers to do was now being operated by one puppeteer on this tower system. And of course, all that came from that simple control that I built that both Jim and Frank said was too much for one performer to do. Mm. <laughs> wow. That's that's incredible. <laughs> and I go, did uh did did Jim Henson get to ever see that happen? Like what you designed that's being used now? I know he passed away around nineteen ninety one, maybe? Yeah. Not really. They hadn't Yeah. They hadn't developed it. It was his son, Brian, who was involved I in see. most of that. In Australia, before The Force Awakens had come out, but I'd actually done the filming now at another convention. And it's like, everybody there is going to want to ask questions about something I can't answer, you know, so what am I going to talk about? So I decided I was going to talk about what it's like to be in one of these costumes, you know, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that a lot of what we put up with voluntarily, sensory deprivation, um, <laughs> the, the gauze, I, I could only breathe out of Akbar's head when the mouth was open, and if you shut the mouth, I couldn't get any fresh air at all. But there were gauze at the back of it, and once you start sitting in there and it becomes a rainforest, the gauze gets covered over. So it's a bit like waterboarding. Oh, <laughs> so no. <laughs> at this convention, I started saying, well, you think you all want to be the next full-body suit artist? Well, let me tell you, it's not unlike the torture techniques of Guantanamo Bay. Well, they we're filming this and it got out onto the internet and then of course the trolls started with the millions of dollars that i earn <laughs> which and they, they also seemed to think it was important that i had my own winnebago which i did have but i shared it with five of the puppeteers on howard the duck that's the only time in my entire career i ever had access to a winnebago that how dare I complain about doing a full body suit? And it's like I wasn't complaining. I was trying to explain to people who cared to know the reality behind <laughs> the image what it was really like, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm an old man. So Rogue One, I'm doing Showland, right? The Milky Bar character. And my friend Aiden is in the other Milky Bar. And so we, he was called, because <laughs> he was Admiral Hour originally, and it was the same exact head, which they just repainted to make Showland, you know, these characters for the other movie. Mm -hmm. So on set, I was always called Milky Bar after the Milky Bar kid. He, he sells chocolate here in England. I don't. I don't know if there's an American equivalent to that. But. No. So I was the Milky Bar kid because I was an actor. Anyway, we're doing our death scene, which 
didn't make it into the movie because they realized if they showed our death scene, then where Darth Vader come when he was doing his final scene, when he was throwing people all over the spaceship. So we did this fabulous death scene nobody ever got to see because they needed the spaceship for Darth Vader to come onto. So we're doing this, and I can see out of my nostril, which is the only way you can see out of these heads, you know, that Aiden had really gone for it, you know, and they shouted explosion. He'd thrown himself over the back of his chair onto the floor, and it's like, you ain't going to die better than Akbar. I'm going to die better than you, <laughs> you know, because we got in a competition because we're both, we were both um, over 60 years old at this time, but Aiden is a lot better condition than I am. He he still climbs mountains and does all that carry on. You know. Anyway, so we do the next one and we're doing the, they're tilting the camera right and we're all falling left and tilting the camera left and all falling right and all this sort of thing. And then shout explosion. And this time they shout explosion. And I just flew out of my chair and went over Rodus's arm that went out to his chair and everything. So it had looked like I'd broken my back and I just dead and slid down the arm back into the console. <laughs> you know? So it was really good. Except for I'd been sweating so badly and the guy operating the head had forgotten to open the mouth. And I was getting no air at all inside this costume while my heart was doing about 140 beats a minute. You know? So I ran over the AD. I said, I need, I need the air. I need dresser, dresser. They have these cords, uh, Makita blowers that they shove inside the heads, you know, and give you fresh air in there. I need air. I need air. And this young AD looks at me and says, go and sit back down. We haven't finished filming yet. And I said, you don't understand. I'm not going to die in here. I hate air now. Oh, my goodness. And I was really scared to death that I was going to suffocate inside this costume before I convinced somebody that I needed my dresser to give me some <laughs> oh my air. gosh. Oh, wow. And that was Rogue One? That was on Rogue One, yeah. Yeah, wow. That was uh, arguably what most fans consider the best star Wars movie that, that Disney has come out with. Um, which... It's the star Wars movie. I, because I have to fly all over the world <laughs> and sit in airplane seats for 12 hours on end. It's the star Wars movie that I've seen more of the times than any other star Wars. Movie. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I agree. Good. And if you yep. could see the film we shot, it was even better, if you can imagine. Yeah. Oh, man, I wish I could. That's great. You know how these things are. Yeah. I, did a, um, I did a movie called Fierce Creatures. And it was meant to be the sequel to Fish Called Wanda. And it was a sequel in that it was the same company of actors doing it, but the story didn't carry on. It wasn't that way. It was just the sequel because it was the actors. You know. And when we shot this film, it was so screamingly funny that we kept having to redo takes because the crew were ruining sound on the shot because we couldn't not laugh, you know, we go, <laughs> trying, trying to not laugh, and we couldn't not laugh, and we kept ruining the sound. But there was this American producer who, um, I think he works for Disney now, he, he was on it, and he kept having us reshoot shots. We'd shoot it, shoot this great scene, and then he'd have us redo it, and we started calling him the king of comedy, because he thought he was funnier than John Cleese and the, you know, the director. And so we got to the crew screening for it. And John Cleese came out on set and he said, if anybody would like an explanation for what they're about to see, I'll be here for 30 minutes afterwards. And we all cracked up laughing, going, ha, 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 funny, man, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they turned over the cameras. And it was like going to a wake. It was like, what happened?
happened to the movie that we shot. And what happened was they showed a test run of it to a Kansas audience who said, you can't kill Kevin Klein. He's the star of the show. Well, we had Jamie Lee Curtis in the show. We had John Cleese in the show. I mean, there, there were stars in this show all over the show. You know, he wasn't the only one. And um, so they came back and they reshot half the movie. They cut out 70% of the animatronic work that I had done because it all led up to Kevin Klein being killed. <laughs> And I was so demoralized because when you do these movies, you know, they are your life. You lose your family, you lose everything outside of that movie, but you do the movie because you think you're trying to make something great and something special. And uh, to have spent so much of my life <laughs> and put it into this movie to have 70% of it end up on a cutting floor because some American test audience decided they should kill Kevin Klein. I thought, well, that's the movie business totally ruined. <laughs> you know, there, there can be only one director on a movie and somebody needs to explain that to some people. Another story, in case John Boyega ever watches your Echo Base thing. Sure. Uh, I have a, you talk about talking with people on set. Well, of course, when you're in the Akbar costume, it's <laughs> pretty impossible to talk to anybody. But uh, John had come over to me while we were filming Final Day, and he just said, um, is it hot in there? And I said, oh, yeah, but then I started talking to him. I said, to, I just wanted to let him know that when I saw him on The Force Awakens, I thought that he stood head to head with Harrison Ford in every single scene. You know, he's just fantastic. I loved the character that he played in that movie. But I don't know if he ever heard any of it, because by the time I finished telling him how much I loved his performance and what I thought of him, he wasn't there anymore because they'd called him back, but I couldn't see inside the head. So <laughs> I, don't know oh, no. ever, I don't know if he ever heard me say I liked him or not. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will tag him when we make this video live <laughs> and we will, maybe he'll, <laughs> maybe he will see that John Boyega. We hope that you're watching. Uh, Tim Rose appreciates your work, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he was he was brilliant. Yeah, head to head with Harrison the whole way. There was a time I forget uh, ten years ago. Well, it, it was after the first creature story that I told you. It was a combination of being fed up with the way the movie business was going, that it wasn't being made by creative artists anymore. It was being made by accountants and, I don't know, <laughs> people who take statistics or whatever. And I was fed up with being freelance, never knowing if the money earned had to last for three weeks or three months. Because mm -hmm. it made it very hard to plan ahead or have any sort of nice life. And I wanted to live like the other people did and have a steady job with a steady paycheck so I could set my budget and I could live like a normal person. Well, when I tried to get work outside the movie business, the only job I was able to find that would give me a job was Bovis Homes, and I became Bovis Homes maintenance man. So while I was working as Bovis Homes maintenance man, I was still being invited to conventions. And I was feeling incredibly guilty because I thought, if these people knew, they'd all gotten so excited to come and meet this guy and 
he was in the movies and they're all millionaires and all this kind of thing. If they knew I was actually Bovis Holmes' maintenance man, would they even still want to talk to me? And I mentioned this to my mother, who's no longer with us now, but she said that I had been given a gift and I was able to make people happy. And it wasn't about what I was doing. It was about what I had done. And from that point forward, I said, okay, I'm given a gift. I will share this gift as far and wide as I possibly can. <laughs> so that's what I've tried to do. But this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. This has just been great. So uh, I want to thank you for your time and, and the conversation and just everything. And thank you for everything that you've done for the fans. We really appreciate it. And we're going to continue to tell everybody your story and show you appreciation. And uh, we're just we're honored to, to be able to do it. Very nice talking with you. Yes, sir, Tim. Thank you. 